Good morning and welcome to worship here at Mount Olivet Lutheran Church of Plymouth. Uh, we are in church in many places. For all of you uh, who are watching online, good morning to you uh, wherever you are connecting and to all who are here in person in the sanctuary. So very grateful uh, to have um, a partner in the pew with me this morning and I'd like to introduce you to Pastor Bradley Schmelling. Senior Pastor at Gloria Day Lutheran Church in St. Paul, um, a great leader in the Minneapolis-St. Paul area, um, one of my favorite preachers, and um, Bradley and I um, have been able to do uh, some work together, and I think it's just so important for us to hear varied voices from the pulpit as we call a new lead pastor, and Bradley has served in congregations in Ohio and Atlanta and has been at Gloria Day for the last nine years, and that is a congregation who is well engaged with their community um, and the specificity of their mission and vision as they live that out every day. And Bradley, it's just so nice for you to get a glimpse of Mount Olivet here in Minneapolis and uh, for your gift of preaching. This fall, our theme is The Story Unfolds, and it's actually true in the Bible that most stories are the in-between, the meantime, not quite knowing what comes next. And today, a very powerful story that we don't get to hear all the time about Hagar and Ishmael as they are um, pushed out of community and find themselves in the wilderness and what God is up to um, as God hears their cry and forms new community from that time. So um, I entrust God and God's spirit to speak directly to you and to us as a community. And uh, for that, we are very, very grateful. So uh, we begin worship today. I invite you to stand as we sing together. Gather in the name of the creator, redeemer, and author of life. In this time of uncertainty, we confess our sins. God of grace, we come to you 
speaking for ourselves and as a community, naming what is demanding in this world and heavy on our hearts. We wound and have wounds. We speak more than we listen. We rush to judgment without hearing another story. We lead with force rather than compassion. We take for ourselves rather than sharing what we have been given. Forgive us and restore us, trusting that your story of love for the world continues to be written. Amen. God's mercy is immeasurable. There is more than enough. In life, in death, and throughout our journey, God is with us. Hear today what God has already given to you. Forgiveness, love, and a place in God's story, all in the name of Jesus. Amen. pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house, and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Comfort and defend us, gracious Lord. This is the feast of victory for our God. Alleluia. We pray together, God of community, you hear the cries of all people and promise to be present when we are abandoned and alone. Help us see how you create out of injustice. Forgive us as we cast people out. Find us in our desolation. Change our hearts, O oh God, to trust in your wide love for the world. Amen. Al.
perhaps I should begin by thanking for Pastor Beth to have us be seated for this long reading. <laughs> Our scripture this morning is from the book of Genesis, chapter 21, verses 18 through 21. The child grew and was weaned, and Abraham made a great feast on the day that Isaac was weaned. But Sarah saw the son of Hagar, the Egyptian, whom she had borne to Abraham, playing with her son Isaac. So she said to Abraham, cast out this slave woman with her son, for the son of this slave woman shall not inherit along with my son Isaac. The matter was very distressing to Abraham on account of his son. But God said to Abraham, do not be distressed because of the boy and because of your slave woman. Whatever Sarah says to you, do as she tells you, for it is through Isaac that offspring will be named for you. As for the son of the slave woman, I will make a nation of him also, because he is your offspring. So Abraham rose early in the morning and took bread and a skin of water and gave it to Hagar, putting it on her shoulder along with the child and sent her away. And she departed and wandered about in the wilderness of Beersheba. When the water in the skin was gone, she cast the child under one of the bushes. Then she went and sat opposite him a good way off, about the distance of a bow shot. For she said, do not let me look on the death of the child. And as she sat opposite him, she lifted up her voice and wept. And God heard the voice of the boy, and the angel of God called to Hagar from heaven and said to her, what troubles you, Hagar? Do not be afraid, for God has heard the voice of the boy where he is. Come, lift up the boy, hold him fast with your hand, for I will make a great nation of him. Then God opened her eyes and she saw a well of water. She went and filled the skin with water and gave the boy a drink. God was with the boy and he grew up. He lived in the wilderness and became an expert with the bow. He lived in the wilderness of Paran, and his mother got a wife for him from the land of Egypt. Word of God, word of life. Grace and peace to you in the name of Jesus, our light and our life. Good morning. It is such an honor to be here with you this morning. If you don't know it already, you have a spectacular pastor. And she promised me that if I ventured out of St. Paul and crossed the Mississippi River and came to the western suburbs of Minneapolis, she would assign a reading that was light and easy, fun, something easy on the ears. But instead, we have this story that breaks your heart. We should probably do a little backstory here. You're probably all great biblical scholars, but just in case, remember that God promised to Abraham and Sarah that they would be the parents of a great nation, descendants more than the stars in the sky. Well, year after year went by and there was no child. So Sarah decides, rather than the, trusting that the promise would come true, that she would take matters into her own hands. So she takes one of her slaves, a woman from Egypt named Hagar, and forces her to marry Abraham. Hagar gets pregnant and gives birth to Ishmael, which means God hears. Remember that, it's an important part of the story. Well, eventually, as we know, God's promise does come true, and Sarah conceives and bears the child Isaac. So today's reading opens with the problem. The firstborn, the one who is to inherit, 
to become the spiritual leader of the family is Ishmael. So we have Sarah scheming to get rid of the child. Recently, a friend of mine got a hearing aid. On the first day, he could hear sounds that he hadn't heard before. There were birds singing in the morning that he didn't notice. He could hear people talking down the hall at work. He didn't have to turn the TV on so loud. And it was a glorious miracle in many ways. He never realized what he was missing, which actually proved to be that there was a lot of things he really would be happy missing. He turned out being distracted by sounds that hadn't intruded before, and it kind of became overwhelming to his senses, so sometimes now he just turns it off and chooses not to listen. Listening to this story today is an experience like that. There is really almost too much here. Today we would call it human trafficking, or sexual assault. And of course, there's Hagar, who is forced into slavery and has no rights even over her own body. And we hear Sarah, the matriarch, scheming to get rid of a child. And then there's Abraham, who is sort of weaselly here too, unwilling to stand up for what's right, even convincing himself that God is telling him that it's okay to send them away. I wept when I read this. I, I read these texts out loud to myself before I start thinking about them. And when it comes, came to the part about the child being cast under the bush, it touched me. And Hagar's wailing as she turns away, not even able to look at what's happening to her boy. I think I wept because it strikes me that we still live in a world that sounds the same. We cast people out. We leave them to their own resources, convinced that their well-being really isn't our problem. We still use people and then throw them away when they're just not convenient to us anymore. And we still imagine that some, usually from different racial or cultural or sexual classes, don't have and shouldn't have the same rights and privileges that others do. We can, be, we can even convince ourselves that God is okay if we stay silent in the face of injustice and pain. And just as it was thousands of years ago, our current reality is shaped by the implications of slavery. A few weeks ago, it was too much almost to hear about the thousands of Haitian refugees crossing the border huddled under tiny bits of shade under that highway overpass in Houston. The water had run out. Children were wailing. Hagar's world is our world. At Gloria Day, we are currently in the process of turning one of our rooms into an apartment so that we can house an immigrant family that is working its way through our broken and very complicated immigration system. But hearing on that, that story on the news about the vast numbers of people suffering violence and oppression every day, our work seemed like a drop in the bucket. One family at a time hardly seemed like enough. Right now, the world just seems too loud. The noise around vaccination, 
the sobs from children, for the parents of children dying from random gunfire, obnoxious grandstanding by narcissistic politicians, the eerie sounds in the forests because of climate change, and I suspect that there are probably many of you who have enough ringing in your own ears with your daily struggles. Families that didn't quite turn out like you dreamed, or a job that doesn't quite bring the joy and satisfaction that it once did. And we have all this uncertainty about what's next with the pandemic, whether we should show up or stay sheltered and Many of us are just stuck. Couldn't this one hour on Sunday morning be a time to just turn it off? To have something light and fun and inspirational, cute little story? Well, friends, despite that temptation, we have to keep our ears open because love comes through listening. The future turns toward love when we hear the cries. This is the biblical pattern that begins when Adam and Eve are lost in the garden. God hears the cries of those who suffer. Now, of course, you and I will falter. We turn it off or we get exhausted or we just have to take a break. But the good news is that God never does. We have to hear that part of the story just as much, too. God hears the cry of Ishmael. God hears his very name. God hears Hagar and opens her eyes. She sees the well that would save them. In Muslim tradition, Hagar stayed at that well and built a livelihood. People began to arrive and settle around her. A city was built and it was named Mecca. Abraham even visited one day and built the Kaaba, a stone around which to this day the Muslim faithful circle during the annual pilgrimage. Hagar, the Egyptian slave, becomes the mother of two billion Muslims. And Ishmael becomes the father of Arab peoples, a patriarch in Islam. And we should probably hear that part, too. In a world that wants to set one religion over another, a problem that Christians have a lot, God is authoring new people, and new religions. Perhaps one thing we can take from this story is that it's not a stretch for us to see all religious traditions as somehow a gift of God, provided for the healing and well-being of a particular people. God hears the cry for love and peace and justice and provides a means to experience it, a well of love. It doesn't have to all sound the same. David Augsburger says that being heard is so close to being loved that for the average person, they are almost indistinguishable. I don't know what you are bringing into this room this morning that desperately needs to be heard. Maybe it's something you've never said out loud before. Maybe it's something that you say over and over again, hoping that finally someone will hear you. Well, Mother Hagar promises from her own experience that if your cry will be heard by God, and you will be shown some kind of well that holds a future for you. Actually, isn't that an interesting part of the story? 
the well is already there. She just didn't see it until she was directed to it. This world, filled to overflowing with the sounds that assault our ears, is also filled with pools, wells of peace and love, resources that can sustain us in the desert and can become a source for us of new life, new cities, new ways of being. Here's a quote in the children's book, The Little Prince. What makes the desert beautiful is that somewhere it hides a well. What makes the desert beautiful is that somewhere it hides a well. In all of this noise, there is also the giggling, chattering, splashing grace of God. Could we dare trust that if we listen to it all, we will also hear those saving sounds too? And can we trust that today, with all that we have to face, God is right now directing us and leading us to the places that will heal and hold us and change us in all of the ways that we need to be changed. Every desert hides a well. Can you hear it? Sing. Stranger, you're like the 
As we walk the deserts of this life, uh, we confess our faith now, the faith of the church, using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven, and he is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sin, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. As we share the peace and offer um, our gifts to the vision and mission of Mon Olivet, each and every week we tell a story of what we are grateful for, and uh, we have a picture on the screen to show you most specifically of the leaders among us. Uh, one of the ways that we are called to show up in the world is to feed, and um, this is a complex call because it's never done. You have a meal, and the next day you're hungry again. Um, it's relentless work, and it's also the way that God shows up in the world. It's the means by we, which we receive God's grace, uh, God's promise to be in the ordinary things like bread and wine and crackers and juice. And so for Joni Marty, Second Harvest, and for Judy Sterud, um, who links us to PRISM, for Luann and Randy, uh, Randy Svensson, um, who are our connection with Northport, to Bob Carlson, who is Meals on Wheels, also, um, Deb McDonald, who does our loaves and fishes. And so many of you are connected to these feeding ministries. Um, but this is how we show up at Mount Olivet in the community. And we pray especially and are grateful for those partnering organizations and how they show up to feed in the world. And what a gift it is to be able to extend the dailiness of this call uh, to nourish people in body, mind, and spirit. So we are so grateful today for all the ways that these uh, partnerships continue to evolve. And so now um, I extend the peace if you're here in church uh, for you to share a socially um, safe sign of peace with each other for all of you who are online to be able to comment um, and to connect to you in that way. Um, kids, if you are here, we have an offering basket for you. All that money goes to our uh, feeding partners. And um, if you uh, brought your offering today, we have a little box in the back for you to share that with us. And so now may the peace of God be with you all. Let's both share and receive peace from each other. deepens Lord with me Fire the tempter 
Thank you, Dan and Kim. What a gift you are. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior, Jesus Christ, who on this day overcame death in the grave and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. And so with all the choirs of angels and with the church on earth, and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join in their unending hymn. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, broke it, and gave thanks, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup and gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this. For the remembrance of me. We pray now together the prayer Lord Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done 
on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. This is God's table, and there is a place for you. And today, for this overarching sense of presence and love, of hearing and calling from the Old Testament to where we are today, and for Jesus as the connector of these stories, and for us to hear that each time that we come up to this table, Jesus is saying, even in the midst of his death, before his death, the well is already here because I am present with you. That's how close God chooses to be. And we forget that all the time. Life is too dry. And we, like Hagar, are the ones that cry out. And so for us individually and as a community to hear again this grace, this promise that comes as we walk the way, as the story continues to unfold, that God is here and calling us to hear that great presence, especially in the stories and the faces and the lives of others. And so now may the body of Christ be given for you and the blood of Christ shed for you. And now may the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in God's grace. Amen. Um, Bradley here at Mount Olivet, it's after we are forgiven and we hear God's word and we're fed that we pray. And um, you gave us words for this day in your sermon when you said that love comes from listening. And so our prayers of the people are indeed from us. And I think that love is extended and is heard as we speak, as you said today, uh, those things that maybe we've said a lot or maybe we haven't even been able to speak, that God indeed hears that, but uh, we need to hear that from each other But we, because we can't always know. And so know today the prayers that you speak are received within your community who promises to walk along 
with you in those dry places in your life and for us to be changed as the community as we continue to look for those wells among us in those places where we're called not only um, for us to drink, but for us to build community so others can drink from those places of abundance as well. So I'll start us off for all of you online. Feel free to begin to type your comments there. And if you're here on church, um, please just raise your hand and I will come uh, close to you to be able to speak your prayer. So let's pray. God, we hold on to your promise that is ancient and it's real and it's true. For names that we speak today, the founders of our faith and the founders of other faiths for the vastness, the wideness of your love. And for us to hear um, that you continue to work among us as we hear stories of faith in this world to open our eyes to your presence. For this well that we hear of that holds a future for us as a church community, for the wider church, for the world. God, whether it is that we need to turn things up to hear more or we need to turn down to be present with you to hear your voice, whatever it is, continue to give us your grace through stories like these in all those ways. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. I'm going to start first on Lion. Um, Deb, we're praying with you. Prayers of thanks for my husband, John, who turned 65 today and is healthy after one year of his transplant. Yeah, celebrating um, that milestone with you, Deb. Um, happy birthday, John, by the way. And um, one year of major organ transplant for you, for the miracle within your body, um, for the ongoing sense of healing and recovery, Deb, for you, um, and for your whole family as they love and care for John and all the ways that you've been able to show up. Uh, we celebrate this healing. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Allison, we're praying with you. Uh, my Aunt Beth is in the hospital with COVID and is not expected to make it through the weekend. <sighs> Prayers for her comfort and ease in her passing for the medical team and their care and safety for my family. Oh, Allison. Um, uh, praying with you uh, for the reality of this virus uh, that still is among us and taking lives. Uh, we pray for Beth's life, God, as you hold it tenderly now in this world and also in heaven. Uh, for workers who uh, are working around the clock for Beth and for so many others. Um, for them also to be the midwives from this life to the next. And Allison, for you and your mom, your extended family, um, as you um, live in this time of waiting, God, in your mercy. Yeah, um, Monica, for your mom. Uh, Monica, you have been um, in that thin space as well uh, with your mom um, from this life. Uh, to the next. Um, God, we give you thanks for Audrey. And uh, Audrey is now set free from her pain and in illness. And, and Monica, how your mom is within you and uh, for Dave as you kept vigil over these last days. Uh, remind us of this love that crosses borders from this world into heaven. God, in your mercy. Yeah, Lexi, um, praying with Linnea, a high schooler, prays for the students and the teachers getting more into the school year and for the stress, the productivity, and the persistence. Thank you, Linnea. Those are words we are praying um, as we uh, continue to walk these steps of a school year for stress, for the productivity, and for the persistence. Grateful uh, that you're a part of that, Linnea. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Laura, praying with you um, for your mother-in-law, who is home from uh, her time in transitional care. And so, um, God, in all these transitions of our lives, especially for those of our bodies, 
uh, ongoing recovery speak for your mom and uh, love to your family. God in your mercy. What prayers do we have today as we join together here at church? Yes, God. Um, so, um, God, we pray for John today, um, who has been uh, receiving care and treatment for his heart. And so, um, not only for that procedure, um, but ongoing for, um, for John and healing of his body, um, to be with Nancy and his whole family, and for us as a community, um, walking with the Darnells um, during this time. So, um, John, if you're listening online, just know that you have a community of love walking with you uh, for all the things that are unknown right now to trust in his promise that God is close. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Yeah, surely. Yeah. Um, Doris, um, a member here at Mount Olivet, uh, was diagnosed with cancer early on in the spring and um, passed away um, just about a month ago, and her funeral service will be here at Mount Olivet um, on October 30th. And um, for Doris's life, for St. Doris, um, now among us, uh, God, we pray in for her family as um, they prepare um, and they come near not only to grieve, but to proclaim this promise um, that God holds us in this life and now in death. Um, and for all the expressions of care and love in the midst of that, God in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Uh, Bradley, we pray for Gloria Day and all their mission and vision and for the glimpse that we had on the work that you're doing around housing and coming close to families in the St. Paul area and uh, for your leadership among them um, during this time and just um, sincere gratefulness for your proclamation today that we receive as such a gift, God, in your mercy. Um, and I know many of you are uh, walking um, kind of uncertain roads um, with upcoming surgeries and care for parents and things going on in your own families and know today uh, this promise that we speak is for the prayers that we speak uh, together, but also all those things that you're holding um, that are heavy on your heart. Um, may God find you in that place. May you know that that grace and love holds you in that time. Amen. Into your hands, O oh God, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy, your grace, and your love. Amen. Um, a few announcements, um, speaking of uh, Doris's funeral service, All Saints Sunday is coming up on Sunday, uh, November 7th, so within Sunday worship, we will name all those Mount Olivet members who have died over this last year, but starting last year, we have begun a new tradition, and that is um, we have a vigil, a walk from the main church to the chapel, and there will be a specific place for all um, the Mount Olivet members who have died, their picture, their name, and a special memento from their family. And I invite you to come and uh, be present with those families as they grieve. But it's also a reminder of this journey that we're on. We are gifted our chapel and cemetery, and we'll have a short service there at five o'clock where we proclaim light, life in the midst of death. And we also speak the names of these saints of light who are among us in this world who had gifted us um, their bodily sense of love and now um, remember them with love um, on this day as a church. So there's more information you can find out about that and welcome your presence during that service. Um, we have no formal presentation between services today, so I invite you to come up and greet Pastor Bradley and also have some time uh, for coffee yourself. 
And then um, our call committee is in process. Lindy Bondi, who is chairing that committee, is here if you have questions. It was a big week for us. We received applicant names uh, this week and are beginning to uh, be in conversation with them and set up interviews, so your ongoing prayers uh, for this work as we search for a new pastor among us um, in the midst of the unknown um, in each step that we take. And uh, if you have any questions on that, let us know. And then um, lastly, I just want to introduce for you Amy McGrew. Um, Amy, do you want to come up front? Amy is um, helping out in an interim way uh, to lead with Rich Holloway, um, the kids and the family ministry among us, and she's also teaching seventh and eighth grade confirmation. Her name sounds familiar. It's because she is sister of Beth. And um, she is in many varied roles, um, working in a pharmacy and also very called to the church around youth and family. And Amy, we're just grateful for your presence, not only your hands-on work, but the consulting and the leadership that you're bringing. It's great to have you on staff. And just wanted all of you to see Amy uh, real life and in person if you haven't already, and feel free to greet her as well after church. Thanks, Amy. Let's welcome Amy. <clears throat> so I invite you to stand now as we close in song. blessed by God who finds you in the wilderness, by Jesus who listens and forgives, by the Spirit creating a way. Amen. Go in peace. The story unfolds. Come and see.